Welcome to the Dreams of Consciousness podcast. If the two of you would be so kind, would you mind introducing yourselves? Uh, yeah, hi. I'm Chris Spencer from Human Impact. I'm uh, Jim Coleman from Human Impact. Chris and Jim, welcome back. Human Impact Thank were you. on the podcast once before. Back in 2020, we spoke about the self-titled debut. Uh, how would you describe the music of Human Impact? Human Impact. What is human impact? Jim? <laughs> I'd say it's, it's uh, realistic. <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, it's, uh, it's, I don't know. For me, I feel it feels like honest. It feels like, um, you know, a, not just a reflection, but a processing of the, uh, of the world we live in uh, on a number of levels. Um, it's a creative act that's in defiance of that world at times. Um, and it's also like through processing, it's, it's a, a, you know, a process of acceptance of the world that we're in. Does that make sense? Um, uh, sonically, I'd say it's uh, focused and uncompromising. Chris, is there anything you want to add to that? Uh, I mean, music is an interesting thing to try and describe because you really just got to listen to it. Honestly, um, it, we do it the way we do, you know, uh, for a reason. I think it is sort of hard to describe. Uh, human impact is definitely something of a, on a lyrical content sort of level, uh, sort of a commentary on what we're all kind of going through right now in the world, what I'm going through, what Jim's going through. Um, uh, it's not really about like, you know, my girlfriend's breaking up with me or whatever the case. Uh, you know, it's not about really so much my personal problems. Sorry uh, to go too long on this. But uh, and then the music is also uh, very cathartic for me, at least um, a way to sort of get stuff off my chest that um, that I've realized, you know, uh, a fair amount of other people feel the same way. So it's kind of a good way to sort of all all sort of have this catharsis of uh of music and music so there we go jim you're known for your work with cop shoot cop and chris you're, you're known for your time in unsane uh for people who are familiar with those two bands uh, would it be fair to say that human impact uh has has a lot of the elements of those two bands in its sound um, I, I think it has some of the elements, but I think it kind of takes it a little bit further. Um, Jim does a lot more stuff in, in this. There's a lot more layering of his electronics, I feel like. Jim, you can elaborate on that if you want. Um, but in, and in terms of my, my aspect, you know, my stuff of the band, um, it's, a, it's also a little more developed. Uh, I'd say it's very raw, very sort of, you know, just super simple and cathartic um and this contains some of that but at the same time also has a i feel a little more development um which i kind of enjoy so anyway jim yeah i feel like it's weird like so i, I think like um you know our our histories is part of our present right so yeah you're going to hear some uh unsane you're going to hear some cops you cop in there um and you know, we're, we're maybe inhabiting a similar space as far as more aggressive sound. Um, but yeah, I feel like our palette is, is, is a bit different. Um, our sonic palette. And, and it's weird. I think even on a, on a equipment level, right? Like so much of the stuff I, I was doing with, with cop was on this Akai S3000 sampler. It was all samples. Um, and it was just like an Akai S3000 sampler and a, and a control keyboard. Um, and I actually like, for the first time in years, I finally, uh, just yesterday, I've been going through like different like Cyquest drives and zip disks from ages ago. And, and I was able to get, connect that thing and like kind of like access some of those old, those old sounds. But, but that gave things a very particular sound. What we're working with, with human impact is, is much more expansive. Um, and Chris and I have talked recently about like trying to like maybe, I don't know. Uh, I mean, that expansiveness is part of what we're doing. But it's like the, um, um, that, you know, the, the, there's there's a challenging kind of focusing and simplification, right? To me, that's part of the creative process. 
Um, I'm, I'm kind of a maximalist. <laughs> I throw a lot of stuff at the wall and then like creativity is like seeing like what sticks. I, I think I veered off topic a little bit, but I don't, <laughs> hopefully I answered a little bit of what you're talking about. So the last time we spoke was 2020, which was a, a wonderful year for all of us. I think we can all agree. Um, do you want <laughs> to, uh, uh, can you bring listeners up to speed as far as what you guys have been up to with human, human impact since then? Oh. Yeah, I mean, 2020 debut album, right? Came out March 13th, right? As you know, New York City was shutting down, and a lot of the country was shutting down. So, we had some stuff lined up at that point, uh, tours, and you know, um, and, and that just kind of, you know, a lot of stuff didn't happen, right? Um, we put out the the EP um, in the uh, in the interim, or you know, this is kind of our second like real full length uh, uh, record. Uh, we've done some touring in the states we've done some touring in europe um but we feel like you know this this record definitely shows like development i think in terms of like what our sound is and how we how we work as a band um and we're looking forward to getting out um to play live shows with this the last time i spoke with you guys jim i believe you and well one thing that has changed uh is the lineup for human impact uh do you want to do you want to speak about the the two new members oh john and coop yeah during the pandemic during lockdown um i had bought a off this friend of my grandfather a cabin out in the woods on a piece of land out in the national forest in texas um and was out there fixing it up and cooper who i had known from new york since almost as long as i've known jim um, which is an eternity. Uh, but so Cooper had a place in Austin that had a like rehearsal space in his, in his garage. And John Siverson was there as well. Uh, he had recently, there had been some issues with, in his old band daughters. So we, during lockdown, we all really just wanted to play. So we started just playing super early unsane stuff, uh, the very first record and stuff and just playing like three four days a week um playing all the time and then uh later we as the pandemic sort of lifted we uh human impact had a tour uh in europe to do finally it was kind of the one that made it through the entire uh pandemic there were like three or four or something different tours that got canceled but so uh uh Phil Paleo and Chris Pravdika, who originally had been had been let go of by Michael Giraffe Swans, uh, they originally, you know, that was part of the original lineup, and they uh, were out of Swans and then got pulled back in. And I had been playing with Cooper and John really intensively uh, for months, maybe even a year. Um, and so we had this European tour, and it really made sense to have these guys do it, it really kicked up everything into a, a more aggressive, uh, powerful uh, mode of playing that um, that I think really, I, to me, I mean, I, I really like the early stuff, but I think this, this newer stuff is, uh, to me, a little more rewarding in that it, it's just it's just more power. It's more geared towards a live show. It's more geared for an, an audience uh, instead of just being in a studio. Um, so it's really different. But so long story short, sorry, it's been a long story, but John and Cooper are old friends. And uh, we had a European tour that panned out at the end. Jim actually caught COVID during that tour. We had to end it early. But um but those guys jumped on board and did that and have been in the band ever since. So the last time we spoke, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Jim and the other band members were based on the East Coast and you, Chris, were based on the West Coast. And now things have sort of shifted around. So most of the the lineup is, uh, is, is based in Texas. And Jim, I believe you're still on the East Coast? We're no, we're not. We're actually all over the place now. Jim all is in the U.S. Yeah, Jim is in the South. He's in Savannah, Southeast Coast. Uh, John is in the Northeast, outside of Portland and Maine. Uh, Cooper is in Austin, 
but probably moving back to New York at one point. Um, and, and I am in Northern California, north of San Francisco in the Redwoods. So we are, okay. we are all over the country at this point. <laughs> so uh, how, how does songwriting work? For, for a band that's that's in four corners of the U.S., do you guys uh, well, carve out time for uh, to be all together? Yeah, you we trade did. files we back did. and forth. With this, with this one, we really did. We, me and me and Jim and me, me and all the guys, we kind of send files back and forth, um, and then everybody meets up at Cooper's house in Austin, and we all get together and work on them. I I'm still down there a bunch. I still have that place in East Texas. So I, I'm still down there every once in a while. Um, so me and Coop see each other fairly regularly. Um, but yeah, at this point, with this last record, me and Coop and John got together a bunch. And then Jim came in after we had sort of gotten a few ideas together. Um, and then we all just, you know, we, we have a place to, to hang out and, and rehearse there. So it's it's pretty intensive for a few weeks, you know. Can you tell me, how or if uh uh the two new members uh affected the sound of the band or maybe even the the, the way you guys write songs i kind of covered that a little bit but really me and coop and john really love to play you know jim jim sometimes is working but when he's available we all love just actually playing it live like with this one we got to play it live. I actually got to work on some of the vocals, you know, as we play them, which is great. Uh, before, a lot of stuff was remote, so you sort of show up and, and do what you can. Um, but the the two new guys, really, it really adds uh, a much, like I said, a much more live, version oriented ber version of the band. Um, we just, you know, we get together and just kind of hash shit out in a room all together, generally. Um, although a lot of ideas are, are done remotely. So you want to add anything, Jim? Sorry. Sorry to. No, I think, you know, it's like, I mean, it is uh, at the end of the day, kind of a, a hybrid effort of like live and, you know, remote collaboration. It's, it's, uh, you know, um, I don't know. I think this, this album totally benefited from, um, you know, being, you, you know, being together in a room. Um, but then it was also like, there's a long, it's a long process of developing songs and some, some of that process is remote, you know? Um, and then you come back together in, in, in a, in a room and just see like, okay, you know, is, is everything working? And, you know, if it's not, we make, make tweaks, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of cool. If you, after you've done sort of live and then remote and live again and remote again, then you get back together towards the end and it's, you can really adjust all these things so that, so that they're geared for a live performance you know you're not just writing stuff in the studio and then being like oh shit i gotta play that live you know yeah, totally. you've actually played it live a bunch before you even get to the studio so. I, I just give a quick pause also to give a shout out to uh andrew schneider who uh who you know recorded the album and and you know was a great partner on i think it was you know he his ability to to focus not that we're not that we're lacking focus in the studio by any means, but he was able to you know focus the, us in in time in that and like the uh, the sounds that he got was really amazing. Yeah, really amazing. He really pushed us. Like there were times you know I do something and I do it a ton, bunch of times, and he'd be like, "Okay, that's perfect. Now do it again." You know that was kind of <laughs> his, his mo. Is like he wants multiple different you know different versions to pick from, and you know so. Uh, so, uh, previously you worked with Chris and Phil who were in Swans. I'm not familiar with all of, uh, Coop's work, but I, I do know made out of babies and I'm familiar with daughters. It does seem like with the two new members, um, they almost come from a newer generation of noise rock or heavy music. Um, and so that's kind of what I was wondering about how how the collaboration uh, has or might have changed the sound of of human impact if um, these guys coming uh, coming from a different uh, almost a different background. I mean, it, I think it's fair to say that they probably grew up on the music that you guys were doing in the eighties and nineties, right? Oh, uh, I guess so. Me and Cooper have been friends. I mean, I met him when we were both really young. Um, 
I was, I don't know, early 20s and he was late teens. Um, so me and Cooper have known each other forever, forever. Um, and I get, I'm sure John, John is obviously familiar with Unsane and Cop to Cop. Um, but uh, I think Daughters also is a little different from what we do. I mean, I'm sure that he was aware of both bands and everything and listened to both at time at one point or another. But um, but it's a little different. I think what really I mean, I agree with you. They are definitely a younger generation of of this type of music. But um, but we're all super like minded and we're and we're friends, you know, so uh, that's kind of a big part of it to me is is being friends with the people you're in a band with. You know, that that's kind of a, a major issue if you're if you don't get along with the people you're playing music with then why bother in my book so jim did you want to add anything to that no i was just thinking about like the uh you know the road test of uh, who, who do you want to be in a van with for extended periods That's of time you know? yeah like if, if you don't have that you know uh camaraderie or like you know mutual kind of like sensibility and respect yeah it's uh it's not going to last so the last time we spoke, I think, Jim, you said that your sound was representative of your environment. Uh, considering that uh, the environment has changed for, for both of you guys since uh, you started Human Impact, would you say the sound has changed uh, in that regard as well? Well, we didn't have any pan flute on the earlier albums, and we do now. <laughs> <laughs> Damn really? you! You weren't supposed there's, to mention that. There's much that. more woodcutting on this album. I told you never to that. bring that up in public. <laughs> like, we do come it. On, we do it. Keep the secret. Like Jesus, <laughs> come on. We do I was actually have heard by the amount of banjo that was on this album, but you know, I, I <laughs> you, you <laughs> notice that? You notice that too? Oh my God! You can't get away with anything these days. Try and sneak wow. in the pan flute and banjo and. <laughs> Shit. We do actually have Hurdy Gurdy on this record. Yeah, yeah, we do. I mean, that's that's true. true. Yeah. Um, so anyway, I mean, I don't know. It's like, yeah, we're we're living in different spaces, um, in different places, right? Maybe outside of urban environments, but I think like uh the world still creeps in, right? It's like I'm not like so far, I'm not like I haven't done any news blackouts, all that that might change in a few months. Um, but you know. It's the the world is still there. The, the the larger kind of challenges and issues and things are, you know, still prevalent. I think like for me, living yeah closer in, in nature is like um is helpful. Um but it doesn't like doesn't doesn't change the larger world we're in and I you know that we're responding to, if that makes sense. Yeah, and Jim, you know what I, I was just kind of thinking, I mean, we we kind of get out a lot, <laughs> honestly. Yeah, like, yeah. Jim's wife, Beth B, just had this huge, massive uh, film show. I, what would you call that? Film exhibition, I guess. But also, she kind of took over an entire, what used to be a crematorium in Berlin, and had projections on the walls, like a swing in a room with projections on that, and a sandbox with projections around that, and then multiple screen projections, and live performers who are in a movie doing their move, their part of the movie live and just this crazy big thing that was awesome. I'm totally amazing at this place called Silent Green in Berlin. Uh, and I was hanging out there for two weeks with Jim and Beth. Uh, totally amazing. The like love and camaraderie between all the performers and everybody being so uh, creative and really amazing. Um, and you know, we're, we're, we do travel. We get out a lot. It's not like we're just isolated in the woods all the time. I mean, I am a little bit. Living in caves. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but we do get out and, and, and do stuff like that. And I think that's also part of kind of living, like for me out in the redwoods, um, is that I can go and do shit and have this crazy kind of really cool, fun, creative aspect of life. But then really silence, you know, when I get home, it's like, really nice and uh quiet and dead and i can sort of write you know i just kind of sit around and write and clear my mind of all the all the stuff going on around me that that was last week or whatever you know so so the second album by human impact 
It's called Gone Dark, and it will be released on the 4th of October through Epicac Records. We, we spoke uh, quite a bit about the sound of the album and, and how the sound has changed. Um, uh, last time we spoke about the the urban themes that were the present on on the first album. Do you want to tell me about some of the themes, some of the things you sing about this time around? Uh, yeah, sure. If you want, um, I mean, it opens with, with collapse, which is sort of, it, I mean, I guess the overall themes of the record are really about kind of the stuff that we're being sucked into by technology and, I, uh, you know, our governments and this sort of globalized community. Um, we're really de becoming super dependent on electronics uh, and technology in terms of, you know, all your health records, your banking, everything you have is out there. And I, I, I personally just feel like the whole thing's pretty frail. It's really, uh, it's sort of a recipe for the disaster to be so dependent on all these electronics. I mean, it's, we'll see. You know, who, who am I to predict the future? I'm not trying to, but um, but I, I just feel like we're all being pulled into something through sort of convenience and expediency to, you know, oh, it's so easy to get this done now and this done now and this done now. And people are starting to not really pay attention to uh, how vulnerable they may be by by this, you know, this world of convenience uh, being presented. The price of freedom. What? the What's price that? of freedom yeah well there you go i know yeah <laughs> so you know i mean i'm not saying that's kind of the title of the record actually gone dark is really you know kind of about like that sort of you know blackout you know here we go we're going dark i'm disappearing um or it could also mean sort of another way of putting it or another way of interpreting that phrase would be to say things have sort of gone to a darker place. Um, you know, I think we're just being fed a bunch of shitty, horrible information uh, and really manipulated by uh, by the internet, by the, you know, this technology that that is so convenient and easy for everyone. So anyway, that's the general theme, I would say. Jim, do you want any, anything? No, I mean, I mean, Chris and I are, are pretty much on the same page. I, I mean, he, Chris writes all the, all the lyrics. Um, but I think like our, our kind of worldview and sensibility is, is, is totally aligned, um, just both personally, but also, um, you know, with what we do musically, right. And, and also like, even like what we do visually, right. With the videos, I think it's all, it's, it's all kind of the same kind of sensibility and vision. So um, I do think like yeah. in, in in the face of that, this is something we've talked about a little bit recently is like in the, in the face of that, right? It's like on face value, this can be kind of like, you know, uh, like a depressed, seemingly a depressing worldview, right? And and I do think, I do think, yeah, we're in, in uh, a time where it, it's kind of dark and depressing, right? Uh, how, what do you do in the face of that, right? Like we're, we're being creative, we're making music and that uh, is a, type of uh reaction and um um it, it it changes the game for us right um you know so yeah it's, it's, a, a, it's, a, it's a way to sort of really humanize and and sort of say like fuck this <laughs> you know what i mean yeah. in a lot of ways or a response and i i don't know if it's i don't consider it depressing i think saying something Telling something the way it is or the way I see it uh, is cathartic. Um, and at the same time, being able to express my resistance to this sort of uh, um, manipulative grooming, you know, uh, it, it's psychologically, at least for me, it's really good for me. Um, instead of just sitting in a chair and being like, fuck, this fucking sucks, I can actually say something, you know, and just, just do what, you know, express myself. And be creative in in the face of this sort of. Uh, I mean, we'll see. We'll see what happens. You know, it, you never know. This could be AI could liberate all of us, 
I'm I'm sure it'll it'll work out well for all of us. Um, oh when yeah, have, when have corporations ever <laughs> sure, we, yeah. when when have corporations ever let <laughs> us wrong? Just, yeah, we just have to. Yeah, I know. Yeah, no kidding. We just need to trust <laughs> our leaders; it'll all be okay. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so the last time we spoke, you mentioned you were already working on music for a new album, but that was back with uh, the old lineup, back with Chris and Phil. Um, is any of of that music on on Gone Dark, or is most oh. of it on uh, the EP? Only Imperative uh, is uh, Gone Dark, which is was written earlier, but we re-recorded it. Um, you know, with uh, John and Coop. Other than that, uh, everything on Gone Dark is is new material from from the get go with John and Coop. Although um, there's some aspects from the old stuff. Uh, there's definitely pieces that I had that we had done. Before you met, we wrote like 26 songs or something during the pandemic. And there were certain aspects of that, certain little roots mm. or inflections that I thought were really cool that I definitely pulled a couple and used them in stiff parts. Just yeah. so you know, Jim, if you were aware of that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it was the banjo. You got me. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> uh, what happens to, to the music that you haven't released? Uh, it sits on a hard drive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have a shit ton of, of stuff. I think that a lot of the, to me, this my aspect of it, you know, I can't speak for everybody. Um, some of it was kind of, I mean, you're alone in a room writing and you're sort of writing as therapy when you're locked down and don't see people, you know? Um, so I think it was a, to just my personal crap was, was a little, was something of a downer a little bit. It was, it was not, it didn't have the energy that that being in a room with three you know with john coop and jim will have you know what i mean which is a lot of the reason why we basically really cleaned the slate besides imperative and and went in to just play these live you know um yeah i think that for me just writing wise it's good to be in a room with other people you know and try your ideas with them and then let let that develop from there sort of organically instead of just you know, writing 26 songs and being like, oh, how's this? You know, um, we did some of them, but, you know, Imperative was written during that period of time. And I do, I really like that one. So, you know, we did get something out of it. We got one. <laughs> so, as you mentioned, you worked with Andrew Schneider on the album. Uh, Andrew Schneider as, as an engineer. Uh, Chris, you seem to have worked with Andrew Schneider uh, quite a bit in the past. Yes, a lot. Uh, he's done, he remastered the first record when we reissued that. Obviously, I think really, you know, he's done a few Unsane records. Um, and also other stuff I've had where I just come in and say, hey, can you help me mix? And Andrew is a great, is a very good friend um, and has done a ton of stuff. But I really think and always have thought like this queen the unsane record of this queen may be the best album best sounding album unsane did um andrew was amazing uh this the most incredible year i've ever you know dealt with with some making a record with somebody um knows me and us very well so we're all friends and it's really easy for him to say you know perfect do it again after you've done it you know 25 times um we just have a really good working relationship, <clears throat> very relaxed, and and it actually makes it really super fun. Um, you know, he'll do things like have four guitar amps for one track, um, which may seem a bit redundant, but at the same time, when you're done, he really can pull in little aspects of like, you know, an old Marshall JMP in with a AC30 or whatever, you know what I mean? Like he can use all these different amps where I'm using a pro reverb and, you know, so it, it's, he makes this crazy balance with the tone of the things we do and everything, whatever, sorry to go on forever. But uh, Andrew's just a great guy and really an amazing producer and engineer, just the best year, you know, so. Besides your, your relationship with him and your history of working with him, what did you want Andrew to bring to the sound of this album? Um, I really, and we discussed this, we sort of referenced Visqueen, um, honestly, it would just the, and uh, he did a lot of stuff like 
so we we really went back to kind of the best sounding unsane record you know and and in my eyes or any or my ears um and we didn't want to we didn't want to exactly replicate that but at the same time we wanted to keep that in mind as we were recording and use use that sort of really powerful uh drum and bass backdrop for what you know me and jim are doing um a lot of the bass which he did this he did this with Visqueen and, and did it with this one too. Not so much with the drums because the drums sounded really good. We recorded at Cedar Creek in Austin, Texas, which is a, an amazing studio. It's like all wood out in the woods, um, but an all wood room and building. So everything sounds very warm and thick. Um, but he, he tends to do stuff like he's taken drums and put them through a PA in a room, you know, so you get that real live punk rock kind of sound that you can kind of bring in if you want with a bunch of room mics going on too. Um, and then also reamping bass through kind of different stuff that's going to add more low or add more sort of crispier highs. Um, he reamped a lot of Jim synths so that they, they have a different sound and different parts. He's, he's just super creative. Um, and we were just really going because this record was done when we're live. We were going for more of a live sound, so we really tried to keep that in mind, at, you know, as he was recording it, and and we spoke about it before we even started. So, Jim, is it? Yeah, Visqueen. Sorry, uh, please go ahead. No, I was just saying. Yeah, Visqueen was like kind of a uh, a, a starting reference, um, and Andrew was big, you know, like the right the right person for it. Uh, definitely wanted the kind of heaviness, but also focus um, that was on this queen. And I think we we got it, you know. Jim, is it is it tricky bringing in the synths um, uh, and and the atmospheric elements uh, uh, from your contributions and in, into the mix? Because um, it seems like at at certain points uh, those elements might get lost. Yeah, I mean it's not as it's not as uh, challenging as you might think. I mean, they're kind of, um, um, they're, you know, they're, they're typically not like, oh, now let's add the synths. Um, you know, they're kind of part of the, the writing process too. Um, so oftentimes Chris and I will be doing something even that, you know, may be playing off each other on certain frequencies or melodic lines that kind of veer off and uh, create disharmony in a way. Um, so, I mean, even the writing process, it's kind of, there's intentionality to it in terms of the larger landscape, right? Um, um, I like to play a lot with like, where it, where it does get to be tricky is like, you know, some of the low end stuff, right? Is like differentiating uh, the bass and the, and the low end electronics. Um, so I think it, Andrew, Andrew was really aware of that and, um, you know, his, he, he mixed it, mixed it well. Andrew did, I thought Andrew did a, a better job than I could ever imagine anyone being able to do. Like at the end of Reform, I think there's like two or three guitar tracks going on. And then there's like three or four synth tracks. And like you mentioned, that low end thing. And he managed to, to really make it all audible. It doesn't turn into a big pile of mush. Everything is very distinct in its own way. I mean, if you know it's there, I guess, you know, Sneaking in the banjo was also very rough. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, um, but you know what I mean, Jim. He did. He did a really fucking good job with that, man. I, I like absolutely some stuff. I was I was shocked because there's also backing vocals and vocals and you know and main vocal and everything and like the whole thing really fits together like this. It's just an amazing kind of puzzle that he put yeah. together and had everything be audible and uh, and very distinct. You know. So the last time we spoke, I think you had only played together live once, and since then you've you've uh, gone on a few tours. Um, what have you learned from playing live with regards to human impact? What worked yeah. and what did uh? What, I've, what think, learned, uh I've learned. I've learned. I've learned that I love it. It's fucking awesome. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's it's amazing because you get it. When Jim can do this shit with a giant PA, you know, when you have a big PA and you get to hear everything so just amazingly loud and 
visceral. Like you really feel it. Um, Cause a lot of his, some of his stuff, like he was mentioning this low end thing, some of it's just fucking bone shakingly low. So when you get in a place where you can actually hear all this really well, it's just amazing. Um, we, as on the record, you notice, I don't know if you notice on the record, there's sort of interstitials in between songs where things lead into each other and they're sort of, I can fuck around and Jim can fuck around, you know, um, and create sort of a, a whole new atmosphere in between songs. Um, that really, to me, worked live. Um, it was just amazingly fun to sort of end a song and then it's like, and then there's sort of this really cool textural, you know, atmospheric thing. Like on the record, there's some stuff like uh, I'd gone around and recorded stuff with microphones on my wrists, left and right, um, and done some live recording of like a woman screaming outside of a bank and just weird live stuff. So then Jim's actually able to put that stuff in there too. And in a live context, it's it's kind of like how the stuff with Cop Shoot Cop was. You know, Jim, you did some sample stuff where you hear that in like a club or venue context. And it really brings that atmosphere to that place. You know what I mean? Like you're you're in a big room with a giant PA and suddenly you're on 6th Avenue and, you know, 14th Street or something. You know, it, it kind of really, it, I don't know, it, it makes the whole live experience for me uh, even better, even better. Because, you know, before I've done like loops and feedback and crap like that, and, and which I still love doing. But um, but to have this added textural element that Jim adds to the live show to me is is amazing. Yeah, I mean the the live shows are always like kind of like, in in a way, the heart of it. I mean, not 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 at all to like uh, minimize you know, write writing and and uh, and recording and mixing. Right, it's all part of it. But but somehow like the music we're doing, I do feel is like meant to be experienced live, and and, and for us meant to be played live. You know um so that's like that's like our home (laughs) you know when we're able to when we're able to play it's like it's all good so uh by the time people hear this episode or watch it on youtube the album will be out do you guys have any plans for tours for the rest of the year or maybe uh uh, early 2025 uh yeah we're looking at spring of 2025 um we're looking at, I think, I think it's like April fifth, middle of April until like first week of May. Um, I think we're going to be playing Roadburn, which I can safely say because it's not been announced, but this won't come out until after it's already announced. Um, so yeah, yeah, we're just we're gonna kind of do a Europe thing. I think we're gonna try next year to uh, to uh, to do just some kind of small U.S. things um kind of do like the northeast or you know midwest or west coast um and just kind of do different like three four show you know sequences um the we kind of we were originally trying to try tour in november but uh cooper and john john is our john's wife has already had the baby but uh cooper's girl is is due with a baby in january so we're kind of giving the guys some time to hang with the infants <laughs> you know to give them some time with their new kids um so you know so it's gonna be a little while but april and then i think after that we'll cut into the summer and do more stuff so yeah there's stuff on the horizon given that your music pulls from um you know you don't fit neatly into any one genre what kind of bands do you look forward to to tour with? What kind of bands do you like to play with? Oh, I mean, uh, Jim, you can take this, but obviously, sorry to steal it, but we we would love to tour with Jesus Lizard. Like they just put out a new record, you know, and they're they're like friends. We've known them forever. Uh, so them, you know, it's kind of there are bands like them and Melvins that I that I would both love to tour with. So. By the time people hear this episode or watch it on YouTube, Gone Dark will be out through Ipecac Records. Chris and Jim, please tell everyone how they can order the album. What's the best way to get it? 
the best way is to order it through uh, the Ipecac web store or Bandcamp. Um, it's the easiest, I think. And yep, do, absolutely. And do you want to say anything about the the vinyl version that Ipecac is putting out for this? There's oh. a limited edition of uh, colored vinyl. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know the quantity, but there's a limited edition of of uh, of colored vinyl for it. So I'm interested in that. Say, it's just a personal preference, but man, vinyl sounds awesome. <laughs> You know, yeah, big time. Like I've I've listened to every version of this record, digital. Uh, you know, every different possible, you know, situation, and the vinyl sounds incredible. So if you get a chance, get the vinyl. And how can people get merch? Does all of that go through the Bandcamp page? Uh yeah, it should. Yeah, or come see us live. That's kind of the easiest. I, yeah, I think the easiest is uh, come see us live if you can. And if people want to follow Human Impact online and get updates and find out about the tour that you guys mentioned, what's the best way to do that? I think our main thing we're doing now is Instagram. It's Human Impact Band uh, Instagram. We also do a Facebook, um, Human Impact Band Facebook. Uh, we have a site. To be honest, I got to update it. Um, but, you know, the, the Instagram and Facebook are primary ways. Yeah, and I mean, honestly, Ipecac is really fucking good. Uh, Ipecac really um, is good at getting the word out and doing everything. So, I mean, check out other bands on Ipecac as well. It's a great label. They're they're super cool. Uh, really support independent music um, and have some other really good bands on their label as well. Very cool. So, once again, you guys have been very generous with your time, but is there anything else you want to say? Uh, support local music. <laughs> That's about it. Go see live bands, and don't yep. don't pay eighty bucks to go see some band that beats each other up. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! Yeah, it's, it's it seems like there's a lot of like uh, clubs that are struggling, uh, going out of business. So, yeah, um, yeah. Thank you guys so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.